Um, so Aisha Kuchukilmut uh, is a system professor in computer science at University of Nottingham. Previously, she worked uh, as a senior lecturer at the School of Computer Science at the University of Lincoln in the UK. Um, she was an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Engineering at the uh, YDT. Tepe University and a postdoc research associate at the Personal Robotics Lab at Imperial College London. Uh, she was also visiting researcher at the Information Oriented Control Group in the Technical University of Munich. And she received her PhD, Bachelor and Master degrees in Turkey from Koch University and Bilken University. Her research interests include haptics, uh, physical human robot interaction, assistive robotics, and machine learning. Her current work is on human in the loop learning and shared control in the haptic teleoperation domain. Uh, today, she will give a talk on how robots can learn from interacting with humans. I'm excited to hear the talk. All to you, Asha. Thank you. Thank you, Martina, uh, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I believe my talk is more um, application oriented than many of the other talks that we have seen um, over the week. Uh, so hopefully those will be interesting. So I will talk about what kind of applications we are uh, focusing on and what are the research questions that we are looking into. So the aim of uh, my research in general is to have robots in very close interaction with humans, uh, typically in some ways touching them through some objects, for example, when they are carrying objects together or through haptic interfaces when they are uh, working on a common task, uh, sharing some aspects of the task simultaneously, or uh, for example, in an assisted wheelchair scenario when they are actually physically collocated with the robot. Uh, and as Martina has uh, summarized very nicely, my research journey began back uh, in 2007 when I was firstly focusing mostly on uh, human computer interaction and working with uh, haptic devices and how we can enable uh, better interaction um, on, on a shared task. So the ideas we were looking at back then was based on the question on um, how can humans share the control of a common task? Because um, we always had these problems of uh, separating decisional autonomy, uh, where, what the task should be uh, doing at, the, at a specific point for which the human has better information on and uh, merging that with robotic autonomy where the, human, the robot can actually provide some kind of better, more precise, more repetitive motions. And those application scenarios, uh, although in restricted to the human computer interaction uh, applications were then reflected on uh, a robotic scenario at the Technical University of Munich where we tried to merge the robot autonomy with a human autonomy uh, when, when trying to move a table along with a man-sized robot. Um, then after my PhD has ended, I moved to Imperial College London and over there I worked with uh, wheelchairs. And the idea that I focused on over there was uh, how we could program the assistive function for a, a robotic wheelchair. And I will talk about this uh, in further detail, but the problem with the wheelchairs is you're actually dealing with many different people with different requirements. And it is really hard to come up with a one size fits all solution. So we wanted to integrate some kind of machine learning to learn from humans. Um, in 2017, I moved to the University of Lincoln. Over there, I worked uh, on a set of different projects. One of them was uh, a service robotics application where we had uh, this Kitos robot, which is currently at the museum, which is actually closed right now due to the corona situation, uh, and working along with humans. And what we observed around there was uh, the robot was really failing quite a lot in uh, ongoing interaction because uh, of problems in navigation typically or changes in the environment and in most cases the programmatic solutions we can come up with uh, does not really save the robot from those kind of failures and uh, once again we came up with the idea that the robots can actually ask for help and learn from human interactions 
Um, and at the moment, I'm in the University of Nottingham. Uh, I started working there at the beginning of 2020. And uh, currently, all the projects that I'm working on is uh, on robotic manipulation and um, applications of teleoperation, where we try to learn better mechanisms for uh, making robots help or guide human operators in teleoperation settings, uh, mostly focusing on the nuclear scenarios. Um, so in all of my research, what I did was I started with these applications that uh, we focus on robots that just collaborate with humans. And then we came up with these methods that uh, make robots to learn from humans. And the ultimate aim of this research is a robot that can actually complement humans so that it can uh, behave in a very intelligent way, understanding human intentions, human states, uh, so that we can have this very comprehensive system where the robot is actually a peer, which can have its own decisions. Um, and the, as I say, the whole research is uh, for, motivated by this idea that the full autonomy uh, is actually a myth, uh, because currently the robots can actually cannot fully autonomously operate in real world situations. So many of the full autonomy applications are typically restricted to laboratories. Um, and still the human decision-making capabilities and knowledge is much better than robots. So we still need humans when, uh, when we deal with robotic applications. Uh, and there are a few different uh, papers and um, discussions uh, that in indicate the problems of automation. And these uh, stem back to 1980s. Uh, and what these basically say is um, when your applications get more um, closer to human areas or more complicated, the importance of the human operator gets uh, more and more underlined. And uh, Norman, in his 1990 paper, says that um, any kind of system, uh, any kind of system that requires some design, and for this, robotics is no exception, should assume the existence of errors, should enable some kind of continual feedback and continual interaction with the operators to uh, have some mechanisms to uh, recover from the worst of situations that will happen because whenever you're actually working with humans, the worst of the situations would always happen. Um, and the problems with automation also mainly stem from human errors because if you had a autonomous system that's, that would work without the existence of humans, probably that would be an easier problem. Uh, and many, many, many of the problems is because the humans are um, not random, but um, very hard to model elements in your human robot systems. And uh, the human errors stem from the operator or the user that the robot is uh, working along with, or it, the human errors might, might stem from the designer or any of the machine learning algorithms that integrate, you integrate within, within your autonomy. Um, so I won't be really touching on this aspect very much, but um, what is essentially lacking in many of the uh, current systems, which is gaining uh, more and more attention nowadays in the robotics research is better feedback mechanisms, uh, better and continuous feedback mechanisms, which does not annoy or which does not cause overload to the human so that the robots can also effectively uh, communicate about their decisions or their states. Uh, and some of these problems that I have been talking here is uh, requires this better solutions that uh, are less rigid, that are more adaptive and compliant. Uh, and what I do in my research is to tackle these problems by uh, integrating the human into the loop and uh, integrating some kind of adaptation by learning from humans. Um, so I will get this very, very uh, quickly. So we have this concept of levels of autonomy. The autonomous cars uh, have different definitions, but in general robotics, we have this uh, spectrum between 
teleoperation and fully autonomous uh, operation. And at one end, there is basically the result of all studies or teleoperation studies where the human strictly controls the robot. And at the other end, there is the full autonomy behavior where you can leave the robot and forget about it because it would complete the task completely. And in between, uh, there is this whole range of different behaviors where you interact with the human. So you can script a robot behavior and run it. You can uh, have some kind of partial autonomy where the robot performs some portion of the task and the human performs some portion of the task depending on their capabilities. Uh, and there can be supervised autonomous behavior where the robot actually does something and the human inter intervenes to maybe correct it, uh, to give maybe demonstrations to show the robot how to fix it or to maybe share control with the human. And all these behaviors I call human in the loop because you basically have a need for a human to interact with the robot. Um, so the uh, human in the loop solutions depending on the application is also prone to some kind of problems because uh, the way, for example, in supervisory control uh, that you use the human is as a safety system. So you have the system as a mechanism that controls the robot at all times. So the human needs to be aware of system states or system failures or system behaviors at, at all times. He needs to have this very good understanding of uh, the robot behavior, which is sometimes not very easy, especially if you're using some form of black box um, algorithms to implement these behaviors. Uh, and this anticipation of why the robot is failing or if, whether the robot is going to fail uh, would help the human decide whether it's, he should switch the control authority so that he should stop the robot motion and maybe interfere with the task. And this is essentially um, very heavy for the human because it is really tiring and uh, a good understanding of the robot behaviors um, is currently not uh, very much possible. So there are a lot of research which is uh, aiming at making the robot behaviors more legible, more uh, explainable. Um, and these are, I think, going to make a big impact in the human-robot interaction research in the uh, future years. Um, so my research is on shared control and the shared control or shared autonomy uh, is based on this H metaphor. So the H here stands for a horse uh, and is based on the idea that this perfect shared control mechanism is a, a horse which has its own decision making mechanisms, which has its uh, own safety mechanisms, but you can still put a rein on the horse and you can still command it by learning how to do it. And in these kind of uh, applications, if you had a horse, for example, your robot would be aware of the environment, aware of what you intend to do with the environment and help you achieve better performance, better safety, but also communicate its intentions. And this kind of a system is what we try to uh, achieve with shared control. So in this talk, uh, which I spent almost half of it, <laughs> I will talk about robots uh, in different applications. So the first application scenario is this um, uh, social robot, service robot that learns how to recover from, from failures in a uh, public space from demonstrations from humans. The second application uh, will be learning for mobility assistance. So how we can implement the uh, assistance behavior on uh, a assistive wheelchair by programming a robotic controller within it. Uh, and the third application is on teleoperation where we make robots learn how to guide humans based on uh, demonstrations or interactions from humans. Um, so as I say, my first application uh, is a social robotics scenario. And this is what I call interactive learning for traded control, because basically uh, what we try to do is we try to interact with these robots when they fail. And these two videos actually show some uh, 
simple failure situations which are regenerated in our lab environments. And um, these include some corner case scenarios, for example, the robot trying to pass through a very narrow corridor, uh, and although it can fit in the corridor, it uh, thinks that it is really very close, so the uh, safety parameters is not relaxed enough to allow for, for that passage, or in the specific case, the navigation is failing because uh, the ro robot's topological navigation note that it aims to reach at the next step is very close to this corner. So the robot is generating this weird recovery behavior. It's trying to go to that next point. And then at the middle of the plan, it's failing and starting rotating, coming up with this not very intelligent looking uh, interaction. And these kind of failures are very crucial uh, when it comes to um, service robotics applications, because who you are dealing with in these applications are the members of the public and their perception and trusts against the robots can change very, very fast. So if a robot does this very often, um, people would stop using it. And these navigation failures are actually very common in state of the art robotic systems. If you have a robotic hover in your house, you would know how often it can fail, how often you're asked to maybe move the robot to a safe location so that it can do the localization once again and, uh, and save itself. But this does actually require some kind of human intervention. And what is known is this, these kind of human interventions when you, you hold the robot and put it to a safer place is the best recovery methodology. Um, however, even though these human interventions are the best methodology to save the uh, robots, the idea behind this project was that we don't actually leverage that uh, information, that information gained from these human inter interventions, this information gained from how humans save these robots from the, those troubling situations is not actually used. Um, and the idea that we had was, um, why don't we create this ask for help framework for a robot? And uh, in case a robot fails, why don't we remember when it failed? And why don't we come up with maybe a classification system that looks at the situation and decides whether that situation or a similar situation has been uh, seen before, and if it is seen, maybe go to a kind of a library of recovery behaviors and select something that can be applied afterwards. For example, on this narrow corridor case, which is quite common, the robot can understand that it's in a cor corridor, and the basic uh, recovery behavior in such a corridor is to maybe just go forward a little bit and see if you can fit in there. Uh, and for this, we created this two layer uh, learning framework where we leveraged the 360 laser scan data coming from the robot. Uh, and over a temporal scan window, we, uh, we collect features for, to be fed into the learning algorithms. And in both, um, so, so this framework consists of a classifier. So over the temporal scan window of uh, the subsampled scans around the robot, we collect labeled data. So we come up with a failure situation. And in the failure situation, if the robot understands, if the navigation system basically fails, the robot uh, prompts the user to give some uh, give some input. So the robot stops and asks the human whether this is a failure situation that he or she wants to demonstrate a solution to. And if the human says yes, we register that situation as a failure case to be put into our data set of failure uh, instances. 
and the robot also can ask for a situation, ask for a encounter a situation, and asks for a human whether this is a situation uh, that is a potential failure, and the human can also say no, it's not a failure. So this can be registered in our data set as a non-failure instance. And what we did with these failure and non-failure instances consisting of the laser scan uh, features over a temporal scan window is we trained a Gaussian process classifier using a linear kernel so that we can generate a one or a zero uh, saying that it's a failure or not. And in the meanwhile, while we asked whether a situation is a failure or not, we asked the human to also demonstrate the trajectory. So if the human responds that this is a genuine failure and he wants to demonstrate the trajectory, we collect the same data, the 360 uh, degrees scan, subsample scan data over this temporal scan window. Uh, and we use these along with the commanding velocities given by the human to learn a Gaussian process regression model using an exponential kernel. And this regression model basically models the assistance, models the recovery behavior as a combination of linear and angular velocities. And this is the whole framework that uh, we use to learn how to classify and how to uh, get over problem situations. Um, so basically how the framework works is uh, it is built on the uh, very classical robot navigation system. So the global navigation system consisting of a plan uh, that allows the robot to go in between certain topological nodes in a topological map. And um, we have these go to waypoint behaviors, uh, which is implemented as topological navigation. And the goal position is between these topological nodes is solved through the move base, uh, which is um, the common framework for mobile robotics in, in the ROS, arc, um, ROS system. And the move base gives you a velocity command. And this is the ideal autonomous behavior that you expect from the robot. However, whenever there is a failure, we create these local navigation systems. So the failure navigation uh, class failure classifier always works in the background. And in case there is a failure signal, the plan is stopped and a recovery is executed from these library of uh, recovery behaviors that are learned through the GP regression. And these recovery behaviors, the velocities, the angular and linear velocities learned through this recovery regressor is uh, used to override the velocity commands that should come from the move base. Um, so the overall approach is shown here. So here, Mobase is controlling the robot and the robot uh, perceives a failure. The human comes in and demonstrates a recovery and the robot uh, goes back to Mobase and checks whether there is another failure or not. And this goes on as many times as possible. We have evaluated how many demonstrations were uh, sufficient to learn uh, good enough behaviors and around 30, 40 behaviors, you come up with a nice model that can actually classify failures and uh, learn them. Um, and afterwards, you, use, you can use that model in ongoing collaboration. So here, the robot moves around and it perceives the situation where it's failing. And at that moment, it asks the human whether it should go for the recovery behavior. And the human says, yes, go forward. The robot executes that recovery behavior. And whenever possible, uh, after that recovery behavior ends, it moves back to the move base. And the idea behind uh, this approach is to make the robot more and more autonomous over time. And in this uh, implementation, we didn't really cancel out the verification from the human because um, the failure situations can still be misrecognized. Okay. Um, yeah, so the second application that uh, I will talk about is this 
assistive robotics scenario. Um, okay. Uh, and this is this was uh, shot in our lab at Imperial College, which we shared with Martina back in the days. Uh, and although the video is not really showing for some reason, I think due to my uh, internet today, um, this is Tom Carlson, who's currently at UCL doing similar research, uh, who's demonstrating a fully autonomous system. So the navigation, uh, as I say, on a mobile robot in a well-known environment, which you can map with uh, not so many dynamic elements or not so many people to interfere with your operation is a pretty much um, stable operation. And what he actually shows here by putting his hands is that is not at all controlling the robot. The robot is fully autonomous. However, this kind of solutions is uh, really, bad when it comes to applications because humans don't want to be carried around like cargo if they are uh, bound to wheelchairs and in the second application um, we show a child who had a uh, brain surgery and again uh, although the video is not very smooth uh, what is shown is that he's given this uh, prototype wheelchair that was developed in, in our lab that enables collision avoidance. Um, because the, in the situation of this child, because of the brain surgery, the child is not actually um, perceiving fear correctly. Uh, so it is really dangerous for him to drive such a strong equipment. So the NHS wouldn't really give him a robotic wheelchair uh, and because his mobility would be restrained, he won't be cognitively developing, which is, which is a big problem. So the, what is demonstrated here is very, very basic. It is only collision avoidance so that the robot is actually stopping when the, the kid is very close to collisions. And uh, it's not really very easy to control for him because he still wants to go forward and such. And in these two situations, what you see is two different, two contrasting cases. In one case, the human won't control because um, what, what, what is only missing is, um, is the mobility ability. So the human can actually effectively control and he could do a better job than the robot. And in the second one, you would need maybe more robot autonomy for safeguarding because humans also need safety. And in case that you have these different different requirements across users, uh, a shared control formulation is really very good because you can learn a robot autonomous model, which can be blended with human operation. And by selecting correct degrees of autonomy for a particular person, you can enable different behaviors without changing the underlying model too much. Um, and the shared control implementation we had uh, is demonstrated here. So this is just a selected autonomy division between the human and the uh, autonomous system. And here, what is shown is uh, I'm on the wheelchair. There is a person on a remote computer who can actually drive the wheelchair remotely and uh, we are actually collaborating on driving the wheelchair um, so i'm not sure why my videos are jumping around but in the initial phase the teleoperator is actually fully controlling the robot akin to a autonomous controller and at a certain point i take on because i think that there is uh, this potential collision and i stop the robot and what we try to come up with this solution is uh, a, a few things. So we wanted to dynamically control the robotic behavior through shared control so that we wanted to learn how this remote human is actually managing the assistance because the, uh, the reason we put a remote assistance is because we assume that the human who is driving the wheelchair might have some problems uh, and then that person can maybe assist that person to maybe similar to the previous example to recover from failure situations and we want to 
leverage that information to learn that data and integrate that into the robot as a uh, assistance behavior. Um, and in this one, um, we don't have these uh, changing autonomy levels for each actors, but we have various degrees of autonomy by um, integrating machine learning into this uh, so that the behavior is actually modulated depending on how actively the uh, remote fellow operator has uh, provided assistance to the human. And we also put uh, some haptics joysticks on uh, on the robot and at the hand of the teleoperator to put better awareness of the system state to the decisions to the human so that the assistance behavior, which is the um, in mobile robotics is typically the velocity commands that is issued on the on, on the on the robot. Um, we wanted to make them visible through some kind of sensory modality to the human and we thought that haptics could be the ideal uh, way to convey that information because it is bi-directional, it is transparent and such. And in this setting, we have the humans have the autonomy to overrule system decisions at all times. So if the driver wants to uh, stop it, we gave the human a little bit of an advantage to be able to do so. And the method is very similar to what we had discussed in the previous example, only in this one, we use a Gaussian process regression model only. So what we look at is the user's velocity commands that uh, is issued on the wheelchair, the environmental context consisting of distances to nearby obstacles around a circle around the robot and the robot state, meaning uh, its velocity, uh, which encodes some information in your model about what is my distance to an object and whether I am actually moving towards or farther away from that object, which is quite important information to enable generalization of the model. And using these information as inputs, we learn the assistance commands, the assistance commands initially provided by the teleoperator uh, to be the estimated assistance commands that should be given by the semi-autonomous system. So the, in the demonstration, this data is captured through the interaction of a driver and the teleoperator. And in the estimation, we take the teleoperator away and we use the model and the model generated assistance commands to implement the autonomy of the robot. And what we have demonstrated uh, in the experiment um, is basically this scenario. So I won't be possibly showing it because it's really jumpy, uh, but we created this environment. And in this environment, we have this figure eight like shape that is gone through with the collaboration of the human and the remote operator to learn a regression process. And um, what we have observed afterwards is uh, if we take away the human, the robot can actually learn that motion. So in here on the top corner, what you see is um, the assistance commands of the uh, robot and the human. And what is actually shown here is that the robot helps really to turn these corners by uh, making the robot move a little bit in advanced than the human. And what we also try to see here is whether this uh, would be a very constraining motion. So if I move my robot, but I decide that I don't want to actually go to the uh, corridor, but if I choose to go forward would the model allow me to explore different trajectories and because of the um, data that we chose to use around the robot state and the distances we saw that uh, this kind of different trajectories in the same environment can also be handled quite successfully. Um, so what we did in the experiment was we did a one shot learning. So we took only a single demonstration from the remote assistant and we modeled this behavior. And uh, 
we did some tests afterwards to see if we can estimate the uh, that that assistance commands carefully um, cor successfully, and we saw that the rotational and angular velocity commands in the figure eight track or the rectangular track can be estimated with good performance. Uh, and I want to actually put a few slides here to say that. Uh, talk a little bit about the evaluation because when evaluating uh, machine learning algorithms, we typically go on to simulations and we test or we verify the algorithms. But one thing that is probably important when you're dealing with uh, such applications, when you have humans around and when you try to have this system improve human interactivity, for example, in the service robotics case or in this scenario, you need to do some form of human studies. And uh, this is what I mean by whenever you put humans into play, the worst of the scenarios would happen because you have to consider what you want to measure and what you want to achieve. Uh, and you should successfully demonstrate that your system is allowing you to uh, reach these performance or interaction related goals that you are achieving with this system. So this specific example uh, was tested with 24 subjects and we had a few hypotheses to test at the beginning of the study. So the first hypothesis was that the learned model can generate assistance comparable to human assistance. So we were interested in seeing that we could actually generate uh, or mimic the assistance generated by the human to a good degree. And for that, we had a variable introduced in our experiment consisting of human-human data and human-robot data so that we could see that the performance benefits of the human-human and human-robot teaming experience is also comparable. So this is in addition to comparing the velocity signals that you learn uh, and comparing whether that matches the human operator's signals. The other question we had was about the haptics so I have, and we were interested in whether seeing whether putting a haptic joystick was really worth it, would it make them feel better? Uh, and you have to actually define better as well. So we integrated haptic and non-haptic conditions into the experiment. And the third hypothesis we had was that the model can actually generalize to unseen trajectories. That's why we had these two tracks, figure eight and the rectangle as shown here. Uh, and I could say that this is really a very complicated uh, experiment. And after managing to analyze this, uh, I told myself I would never include so many hypotheses in a single study, which could be a take home message from this summer school as well, because it gets really very, very complicated and the results that you um, start to observe lose their strength uh, once you start putting more and more variables into your experimental design. Um, and firstly, we did some experiments on visually inspecting what is going on and we kind of verified the assistance generation Visually, so in here, what you see is this demonstration trial, the one shot trial over multiple people and the red areas show where the assistance was predominantly given. So in here, you can see that the human was kind of giving an on and off assistance and in this region, there was more assistance than normal. And what we saw was in the, the uh, estimation, uh, the estimation trials, which are after the demonstration trial, the ground truth and assistance estimation maps, heat maps are kind of similar. And we have these demonstrated under a haptic condition and the non-haptic condition. Uh, and in the non-haptic condition, we can even see that the ground truth assistance that is given to humans is actually a little bit higher than it is in the haptic condition. And uh, in both cases, the estimated assistance in here uh, for the rectangular track is seen as significantly lower in magnitude than what is actually given by the human, although the locations are more or less matching. Um, 
And finally, there is this statistical analysis of user experience where we looked at different metrics, such as lab completion times or the minimum distance to uh, obstacles. And what we observed here is the lab completion time was significantly increased for the HRI case, human robot interaction case, which is expected. Um, the, however, the average distance to obstacles were similar for uh, human robot and human human interactions. And we saw that the haptic feedback did not really affect test performance, which is a good thing because it's an additional modality which, which could introduce uh, cognitive load. Um, so the other two results are about the efforts put by the human. So we have the forces of the uh, human applied on the uh, haptic joystick and the jerkiness of the human joystick motions. And what we saw was that the effort for the human uh, were similar in the HRI and HHI cases, but only when no haptic feedback is provided. So with haptic feedback, we saw that effort requirements of the humans dropped. And in the human-human case, we saw that the user's motion jerk increased with haptic feedback, possibly due to some kind of stabilization effects of being creating this coupled system. Um, so these, this experiment actually opened more uh, open questions than uh, the answered ones, but from the machine learning perspective, we could see that this approach could generate good assistance functions, but there are a lot of things that we are yet to understand uh, on human motor control. And that is why, uh, these very coupled systems are quite important to be tackled with machine learning algorithms to have more understanding of what or how humans are controlling. So the final applications I will talk about are on the teleoperation. So um, we are currently partners in the HEAP project, which is focused on the uh, human guided control and benchmarking of robotic heap sorting applications in nuclear teleoperation scenarios. And for that, we created a um, set of different teleoperation settings, one being a simulation setup, uh, especially due to the lockdown, we were doing many of the work in simulation. Uh, and in the simulation, we are actually using uh, haptic joysticks to control the simulated robot. But the similar um, scenario is also implemented on a real robot. And in this video, what is shown is the control of the real robot in the lab from a home environment where we use a VPN server to communicate with the robot uh, through ROS over the internet. And the architecture that we use here is uh, quite standard haptic control. Um, so what we have is a haptic joystick which provides a position and that position is mapped onto the workspace of the robot because the workspaces of the haptic device and the robot are drastically different so that we can compute a desired and effective position in the robot frame. And through solving inverse kinematics, we come up with the desired joint positions to be sent to a controller to produce control signals uh, and control the robot in a closed loop fashion. And from the robot, we observe the joint torques. Uh, we are using a Franca Emika Panda robot, which has uh, torque sensors at each joint. So we can capture the joint torques from the robot directly. Uh, and for this specific device, we are actually um, computing the end effector forces through the joint torques to come up with a contact force, which is then scaled to uh, issue the uh, force feedback that the user should be feeling. And we had done some work on uh, how we can generate effective force feedback and how we can merge environmental contact force feedback, which is captured through the joints of the robot and how we can merge it with assistive forces, which could maybe guide you to a object or uh, which could repel you from obstacles. 
and we created this uh, two layer architecture for that purpose, which was uh, published very recently. Um, so I won't be going in depth for this, but I will talk about uh, our not new conceptual shared control teleoperation framework, which uh, we are currently using for a, diff a set of different applications. Uh, and once again, in this scenario, we have integrated this learning from demonstration mechanism into the control architecture to learn good motions for the human. In this application scenario, we are uh, using once again an expert uh, person, expert teleoperator to guide a master robot to move a slave robot. And we are using these demonstrations to model trajectories. And unlike the previous examples, which was using PROMPs, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Gaussian processes, this architecture uses PROMPs, which is a popular model used for generating robot trajectories. So the PROMPs are the probabilistic uh, representation for dynamic motion primitives, which are nonlinear dynamical systems which can generate uh, nonlinear trajectories for robot motion. And in here, the trajectory modeling part can teach the robot a collection of behaviors. And these behaviors, the mean and uh, uh, variance trajectories are, are fed into an assistance controller to decide on what kind of forces should be issued on the master system to be uh, felt and to be uh, fed back as guidance forces to the human. And the rest of the architecture is very, very similar to what I have described. Um, so one study we completed recently and recently submitted to uh, ICRA this year uses that idea to collect PROMP trajectories as baseline trajectories on how to reach objects and integrates it with uh, human intent prediction uh, mechanisms for providing haptic guidance to the humans. So the scenario that we have here is um, based on the assumption that there, there can be a heap of objects on a scene and the hum a human can uh, be asked to maybe sort them. So this is a very simplification of a scenario that is that has real life implications. For example, it can be a nuclear waste zone where the human is actually sorting these objects depending on how dangerous they are. And uh, this kind of problems are very hard for the robot for a multiple of reasons because um, the perception is hard, uh, but even if you solve the perception, there, it is really, uh, hard for the robot to decide whether what, what, what is the characteristic of the object is the dangerous object or not. And in here, what we are trying to mimic is that uh, we are coloring the objects and we are asking the human to, uh, to sort the objects according to colors, but we are not actually telling the colors to the robot, although this could be, a, this could be argued to be a easy problem for the robot, think about the motivating example. And, um, the aim here is to learn to trajectories for reaching each of these objects and reaching each of these trays as a collection of behaviors uh, and try to modulate these trajectories and try to select in between these trajectories while the robot is um, moving within the scene. So we actually use here a DQN model for intent detection and we are using the current end effector position uh, as an input for this. And we, call, we, we look at a distance-based uh, cost to uh, select which is the intended object. And in the video, we show that as the humans are moving around in the scene, the robot can dynamically change the selected intended object. So here, this yellow Lego piece is approached. Then here, the small tool is being approached. Uh, and then with the 
small movements of the humans, we can see that the uh, robot is changing its behavior. And here, um, what is also integrated is these trajectories. Once the intended object is detected, we come up with this trajectory to reach that object, and we give that trajectory to guide the human toward that object to make his or her life easier. And this adaptive assistance is actually weighted by uh, a belief coefficient um, based on the distance of the end effector to the intended PRMP trajectories. Um, so that the human is actually given guidance based on how close the, the action is matching the real, uh, real operation. Um, so yeah, that is the end of my presentation. I do some shameless self-promotion. We are currently, or we are going to open a few positions, some postdoc positions and PhD positions will be opened in the coming month. Uh, to work on teleoperation and robot learning and role allocation applications on these. So if you're interested, please feel free to contact me. Um, and that's all from me now.